Welcome to episode 21 of the G2 on 5G. It's everything related to 5G. We cover six topics in about 15 minutes, and it's brought to you for more insights and strategy. I'm Will Townsend. I am traveling today. I'm currently in Dallas, traveling to Denver. Joining me is uh, my fellow partner in crime, Angel Sag. And we have another guest on the podcast this week, the illustrious Mark Dina. Mark, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for letting me join the call today. Yeah, look forward to your insights here. We're going to talk about Apple in a minute, but my first topic this week, I'm going to take kind of a personal um, angle, and I, uh, I did some uh, moderating of online panels at the MVNO World Congress this week. It was actually in London, obviously a virtual event, and I hosted a fireside chat with one MVNO here in the U.S., and then um, I hosted a panel discussion that involved um, Deutsche Telekom um, as well as 3UK. And we were talking about how MVNOs can cooperate with uh, the, the mobile network operators. Obviously, the mobile network operators are the ones that are investing the billions of dollars in the 5G build out. But you know, the opportunity that we talked about was um, there, there is an opportunity for these you know, mobile virtual network operators that leverage the infrastructure that the, that the core mobile network operators provide to deliver differentiated services. And private networking came up and you know that's something that I've talked about on prior podcasts. And so I think the MVNO opportunity is it's gonna allow service niching to occur. So as we you know, we see network slicing and that sort of thing on these future 5G networks. Um, some of the larger operators may just focus on you know core, you know, automation and manufacturing and obviously, you know, sort of autonomous driving and sort of the big total addressable market opportunities. But I really believe after spending time with these, um, you know, with these folks this week, um, that um, the MVNOs are going to be able to really uh, kind of niche and, you know, focus in areas that maybe the, the, the big guys won't. So I don't know. I mean, Angel, do you, do you follow the MVNOs at all? Yeah, I, I would say I don't follow them as closely as I do the, the, the tier, tier one operators. Yeah. Um, but what I, what I find interesting and the thought that crossed my mind was that I think there's a possibility we could have MVNOs that don't exist today that will exist once network slicing becomes a reality. And we could mm -hmm. have you know some MVNOs that have established a specific service level agreement with these operators utilizing you know the maximum amount of the 5g network that these operators have invested yeah. in to deliver like you said differentiated services but in niches that i don't think they're willing to go after or they're not particularly experts in so like i could see you know maybe a an nvidia um offering like a gaming network service that's just about yeah. gaming and just right. you know because they have a cloud gaming service you know they need some kind of connectivity right um, mm -hmm. So what if they just become an MBNO and start offering it as a, as a layer, right? Because right now operators yeah. are licensing that um, as a service, but there's a possibility mm -hmm. that they might just go and do it on their own and just become yeah. an MBNO. Um, so yeah. I think we're going to see, I think we may see some new um, MVNOs pop up after more operators start rolling out network slicing. Um, but yeah, I think it's going to be interesting to see more differentiation. I think 5G is going to enable more MVNOs and more differentiation just because of the network slicing. Um, yep. But yeah, that's kind of my thought. I kind of agree uh, with you. Yeah, yeah. You know, and you know, the, the, obviously the low latency that comes with 5G, you know, five sub millisecond um, is going to unlock a whole host of things like, you know, mobile gaming. Hey Mark, you know, we've got you on the podcast this week. You know, you cover smart home. Any, any thoughts there? Are, are you following 5G and the impact on smart home and gaming and all that good stuff? Yeah, well, the, the, you know, the 5G thing obviously is, the, I think, the big, big issue uh, that, uh, you know, consumers are grappling with. I, I think there is still some confusion, frankly, and, and you, you guys have spoken um, enormously about that topic in terms of customer confusion about millimeter wave versus other variants. Um, and, you know, in this respective um, or specific to the smart home and, you know, managing devices within your home, 5G is probably not as important as it is in a cellular, you know, um, in, in a cell phone uh, uh, context, mobile. in a yeah. mobile device context. I thought what was interesting, and we're going to talk about it in a few minutes, is what Apple didn't announce earlier in the week. I know we're going to get to that in a second, but uh, there was not a mention of 5G uh, during the, uh, you know, although I think I'll show you have a conspiracy theory about probably why that didn't happen with the iPads. 
Yeah. Yeah. We'll, yeah. We'll get there. Yeah. I, I was going to mention one thing, Mark. I think fixed wireless access to the home, yep. I think, is a 5G um, opportunity, and especially in parts of the world where you don't have fiber to the last mile. But um, but I agree. Mobile mobile is the killer killer app with 5G. Sorry. No, yeah. I, 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 I will make one statement. You know what the Netgear announced this week? They did announce their first 5G Wi-Fi six combo uh, hotspot uh, router. Uh, which I, you know, I've been maintaining for quite some time that, you know, for those, for those uh, homes and businesses that, you know, have that last mile problem, those combo routers, you know, once the 5G network is deployed, they're going to be very interesting because it's a great way to take that pipe that comes into the home and then spread that Wi-Fi 6 coverage th th throughout the home. And, and you're going to see more of, of solutions like that. So that was kind of interesting to see that Netgear has, is out front with that. And it's an AT&T AT &T partnership uh, offering. Yeah. That did, that did get announced two days ago. You're right. Yeah. Um, it's I think originally I showed it off in January at CES, yes. and yes. it's been like nine oh, months. months. <laughs> mm -hmm. Interesting. Hey, well, let's for the sake of time, Angela, let's get to your first topic this week. Sure. So my first topic is again millimeter wave. Um, Qualcomm and U.S. Cellular this time uh, have worked together with Ericsson to deliver a three mile millimeter wave uh, trial. Basically what they did is they um, use Ericsson equipment uh, and so US Cellular's 28 gigahertz band um, and they were able to get a, a distance of five kilometers at a speed of 100 megabits per second. So they're able to cover um, an area or get a distance of 3.1 miles, which is five kilometers. Um, and 100 megabits in a rural area is a really big deal. Um, because that gives you, you know, broadband-like connectivity without having to have any wired um, connection. And, um, you know, U.S. Cellular is kind of, you know, more of a rural operator. They're, you know, they working in smaller are. cities. You know, yeah, they're, yeah. they're probably, they're way more focused on rural issues. So Qualcomm and Ericsson partnering with them to deliver this, um, you know, use case, which is really fixed wireless, right? I think we all realize that this is a fixed wireless application. Right, right. But this is something where you could put a, you know, a millimeter wave tower in the middle of a town and cover the majority of the town's residents with one tower or maybe a couple of towers. But mm -hmm. minimal investment, um, you know, giving people fast home broadband um, and potentially even cellular connectivity. Um, it's just harder to do mobile cellular, mo mobile millimeter wave um, without line of sight. Um, but if you have fixed yeah. wireless, you can just put it on the roof or some high, you point. know. Right. Point so you to point. Have, you just have to get that that line of sight, um, which is a lot easier with fixed wireless than it is for mobile. Yeah, no, I read about this, and I think it's a great it's a great sort of um, if you want to call it a blueprint for rural. You know, you're absolutely right. U.S. Cellular, they they are, you know, they're they're right behind the the tier ones as far as subscribers and size, and they are definitely focused on rural America. And hey, you know, I think we're going to see more examples of you know of blueprints like this one to be able to get uh, rural America connected. You know, as we know, we've talked about this, Anshal, um, with the Sprint and T-Mobile merger, I mean, there were certain requirements the U.S. government mandated uh, that, you know, they, they focus on rural, right? And we've got, you know, we've got, we've talked about this on, I think, last week's podcast, this rural broadband initiative, Cisco is focused on it. You've got the, the federal government that's going to put a billion bucks into it. You know, that's, that's probably just a scratch on the surface, you know, given what we know about what's required to invest in these future 5G networks, but it's a start in the right direction. So um, let's, let's go to my second topic this week, and I'm only gonna have two so that we can talk more about this Apple announcement and uh, your conspiracy th uh, theories, the two of you, <laughs> since you're our device gurus, but um, um, I spent some time with AT&T. Um, I traveled with them last year to Israel. I spent time at their foundry. And, you know, I think AT&T has done an exceptional job of putting these proof of concept labs together where they bring 5G and edge uh, technologies uh, into play. And they provide um, sandboxes for developers to develop, you know, applications and the next Ubers, you know, that, that we might see that's, that are going to be built on, on top of 5G. And, uh, and I contributed to a blog. It's posted to the AT&T website this week. And... Um, in it, you know, I sort of capture some of those thoughts, but, um, you know, at a, at a high level, you know, I think AT&T is doing great work there. I've been a little critical 
um, of their of their marketing and as, as well as you know you have as well Anshul with uh, you know the whole um, you know 5G you know confusion that they created with uh, 5GE or 5G evolution but um, I think they've kind of learned their lesson there and um, I'm, I'm super impressed so if you're interested hit the AT&T business uh, website and, and read my blog so with that I'm going to kick it back over to you Anshul. Yeah I definitely want to read your blog I haven't had a chance to read it yet so I'll definitely check it out on their business site. Um, awesome. Second topic, it's a pretty short one. Uh, Verizon went out and bought TrackPhone uh, for $6.25 billion, something around there, six, and, six billion and change. Um, and um, that's kind of them, you know, I think expanding their, um, their prepaid business. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's, I've heard rumors that America Mobile, who owns it, um, wanted to get out of that market and wanted to get out of the U.S. So I think that's just them kind of finding a buyer for it. And I think Verizon um, may be interested in, in kind of expanding their potential 5G prepaid offerings. Mm -hmm. um, there hasn't really been much talk about 5G because 5G isn't really being talked much about for prepaid. Um, but I think it's going to be a huge component of, um, you know, how operators build their business models moving forward because I think there's going to be a lot more, um, you know, a lot – more con control of what uh, prepaid users can do on 5G um, if they have prepaid services, um, as usually for lower costs, right? Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, just kind of a, a little bit of a, you know, more acquisitions moving around, more, more consolidation in the market. Um, but yeah, that's, that's just kind of a, just a quick um, update on that. And then the other thing, which was my third topic um, that I wanted to talk about, which was the Apple event. Um, where they announced uh, a series of wearables, mostly new Apple Watches, um, as well as the new iPads. Um, and the big, the big announcement was that they, um, they were, the new iPads are running the new A14 uh, Bionic processors, which um, are supposed to be, well, they're five nanometer chips, um, but they're supposed to be the new iPhone as well. I believe that's what everybody expects. Um, but what's interesting is one, um, they aren't actually going to be available until October, um, which makes me believe, my conspiracy theory, is that um, they are waiting to launch the iPads in October because they probably are going to have 5G models um, yeah. because they didn't announce them at the event. And I suspect that the 5G models will very likely um, be announced in, in, you know, in concert with the 5G iPhones, which we're expecting next month. Um, I'd love to hear Mark's and, you know, take on this? Uh, my Woodward and Bernstein take on that is you're probably right. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's interesting is that the 5G wasn't brought up during the entire broadcast, if you saw it. I mean, and the one thing I'll say before we, 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 we go a bit more and chat about what Anshal brought up is that if you, did, and you did see the broadcast, Anshal, it was nothing, it, it was, first of all, it was completely pre-recorded. I live two and a half miles away from the Apple campus and it was a Broadway, Hollywood, South thing, you know, the, with, with <laughs> towers running around the campus. And, um, but was there, thought, was there rapping, Mark? Was there rapping? Like was there rapping? I don't, I don't was there like you. rapping? No. Rapping? No. <laughs> yeah, I, that's probably very funny, but I did not see that. But what was interesting was that the, you know, for me, the big news of the event was a, uh, the new watches are expanding their TAM. They came out with a low end model, the SC. The SC. Very smart. They want to expand their footprint. Um, they're absolutely, you know, doubling down in health with um, uh, blood oxygen level um, um, uh, ability to monitor that in a big way. And I think, right. by the way, that's a baby step in terms of where they want to go ultimately to use the watch to, you know, diagnose and detect a number of different maladies that a person might have over a period of time. Um, not a lot of discussion about battery life with these new devices, although mm -hmm. I did, although on show I did download the new uh, watch, iOS, uh, watch OS 7. Mm -hmm. on, uh, yesterday when the new operating systems came out and I've already noticed a better battery life even with the series five which is kind of interesting so they're obviously doing some good optimization things but I will say the one thing you know there is obviously a cellular chip in the uh, watches they're not they're not 5g chips uh, no. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's because they haven't quite um, miniaturized 5g, the, uh, 5G, 5G chips. chips as to a point where they can be in a watch yet um, right. I think the expectation is we probably won't see 5G in, smart, in smartwatches for at least two to three years. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that the, uh, the, the, 
the uh, big observation that I would make is uh, two things. Hold on one thing. My, my iPad is talking to me. Oh, come on. <laughs> Please make sure that's included in the podcast. It likes me a lot. But I, I, I think the two other things that was, that was relevant to me was doubling down in health. We talked about that. Uh, they're taking on Peloton. You know, frankly, right. with the Fitness Plus service. Um, of course, it's recorded video versus live video, which is what you have with Peloton, but I'm sure Apple will do it in a very Apple-esque, you know, Hollywood-type way. Um, and the other important thing is, because it does have relevance to, um, to phones, is that with this family sharing capability, they're taking steps to really untether uh, the, watch, uh, the watches from the phone. So they, I mean, they call that a scenario where, hey, maybe uh, a family wants to get watches for their kids, and those are expensive toys. Maybe they're not ready for, uh, for phones yet. But the watches, uh, they can set them up via just one person in the family has to have a phone. It's still not completely untethered, but the, the, uh, that uh, one-to-one ratio hookup that you have to have with the current generation of watches and phones, that goes away. So that it kind of makes me feel, and I'm, Angela, I'd love to get your thoughts on this, that this ultimately will become a standalone device. You know, I think ultimately that's what their strategy is. Yeah, I, I think for a long time, the Apple has been the kind of device, or the Apple Watch, sorry, the Apple Watch has been a device that they've used to tether you to the iPhone, to keep you in the Apple ecosystem. But I think that they know that there's a certain amount of users that just want an Apple Watch and want to be able to use it on its own, myself included. Um, But I think that they see the success of the Apple Watch um, and, you know, they're number one in the market. You know, they're the number one luxury watch manufacturer in the world now. Um, And I just think that, they have to untether it if they want to grow the size of the business Um, because, you know, otherwise they're completely and entirely limited to the size of their smartphone business, which is huge, but it's not the world. Right. And I think Mm -hmm. long term, they want to be able to sell people Apple watches um, so they can buy them and use them as individual devices. Right. I I think you're actually right. I mean, you know, we all know what Apple share is in in the, in the smartphone space. It's, it's not going to ever get to 70 or 80 or 90%. So you have yeah. to find other ways of growing your TAM. And they're li- they were and it said in a different way, they're limiting the appeal of the Apple Watch if they completely keep it tethered to the phone. So that's- right. and, there's, and there's a lot of you know older people and younger children who don't have phones. And this is a great way for them to, you know, start selling both kid watches and el- you know, elder watches, which already exists in the Android universe. Um, and there's a lot of those already selling. It's actually one of the fastest growing segments of the wearable market. Um, so I think they just want to be able to participate in that, um, maybe without having to force people to get iPhones. Right. And the, and the last observation I'd make is that, you know, once again, especially during the fitness um, presentation, they spend an inordinate, an, an inordinate amount of time on privacy. And I think we all agree that Apple, of all the big high tech companies, Apple ha- really has the best reputation when it comes to privacy. And they understand that, for example, they use the analogy that, hey, if uh, someone uses the Fitness Plus app with the app, new Apple Watch to, um, uh, to um, uh, engage in some type of uh, exercise activity, uh, the data will be saved on, on a, at a local basis. They're not going to share the amount of calories, well that you burn <laughs> when you're using <laughs> an Thank Olympic goodness. machine, for example. And I, so I really think that their privacy reputation, their privacy brand is going to help them as they try to grow the appeal of that device into other areas that, hey, you know, by the way, there's a lot of privacy information that I really don't want mother, that mother tech company getting access to. Yeah. You know? yeah. I definitely feel like that they, they hit on that for sure. And I think 5G, having a 5G connection is inherently more private than having a Wi-Fi connection. So that's true. That's true. Um, I think having, yeah. you know, utilizing cellular more is going to just be more secure. Um, but I, I think with that, uh, we can kind of wrap things up this yeah. week. Um, yeah. We hope that our viewers and listeners found this week's topics interesting. Um, if anyone out there would like to provide us with insight on a specific 5G topic or future po- on a future podcast, please reach out to us on social media. Will is at Will Town Tech. I'm at Anshul Sog. And Mark, uh, could you plug your uh, Twitter as well? Mark Vita Tech Guy on Twitter. Mark Vita Tech Guy on Twitter. So we hope you have a great weekend and please tune in again next week.